Sarah Kyle from the Release Manager for the Open Stack Project. And today uh, I will talk about snakes on the cloud, or uh, how we use Python to build like, open source cloud infrastructure software. Wow. Uh, so there will be a number of presentations on cloud stuff already this week, so uh, you can raise your hand if you have now a very precise idea of what cloud computing is. Others, you probably think that a lot of different things are actually described as cloud. And uh, the reason for this is that cloud is a virtual. It's, it's a very trendy result, so if you have anything to sell, you should probably add the word cloud to it, like a presentation title. Yeah, quite a while. <laughs> and And yes, cloud computing actually describes the transition from, from the computing industry from an industry of products to an industry of services. And those the services that are going out of the, that transition uh, have two main characteristics. One is ubiquity, so you can access the service from, from anywhere and, and from any device. And the other is elasticity, where you the services are generally multi-tenant, and you, you don't really have to care about the service scaling for to meet your needs, and you usually pay for uh, what you use exactly. <coughs> Let's get started mostly with services that are geared towards end users, so with the software and service. Salesforce started by, by hosting its CRM solution, or creating a hosting platform for its CRM solution. Then there was uh, Google Docs. Uh, and then almost every website um, that provides some kind of service would call itself cloud as well. So uh, Gmail's cloud, Flickr is cloud, Remember is cloud, Twitter is cloud, and Facebook is cloud, and everything else is cloud too. And the other type of end user services is, is online storage and streaming. So that's what uh, Dropbox does, uh, Amazon Cloud Drive, and Ubuntu One. Or the recent announced iCloud. Very early on, the password factor, I work on the Google one, and uh, the password for us is password. Yeah, we just need to use, use cloud icons, so that counts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> the, the other type of, of services that are born out of cloud computing is are services that are geared towards the system integrators, platform builders, or programmers. Um, there is uh, infrastructure as a service, which is about providing uh, rural compute and storage resources. That's what Amazon Web Services does, and also the right space cloud. And the other type of backend services is deployment platforms. So where you can basically upload your code and they will deploy it for you and scale it for you. That's what the Google App Engine Goku, uh, ET.io, or here this week, and Windows is your Open source. That's an interesting point. Where is open source and all this? So, most of the services are actually using open source building blocks, but the software that they actually use to run their, their service is actually closed source. And the main reason for that is that they, they consider their code the secret source that enables them to uh, prevent the competition from spinning and equipment service with low cost. That said, some companies are, are starting to see why we developing something in common rather than you know, private keys in market. And the main driver for that is, is sharing development costs, obviously, but also the, the promise of, of creating a, a new standard and being part of that standard earlier on. So we're we're saying more on that on that, and we should probably facilitate this. We should encourage that thinking because for for um, consumers of the services, it's it's pretty good to to create competition to eliminate vendor locking if you want to call the cloud services, reducing therefore value of production and and eventually enabling creation of equivalent services. That's where open source is really important in that space. So over the last year, we saw the emergence of three projects. Um, there is Open Compute, that is a, a 
pushed by, by um, Facebook to open source the hardware of the data center design, the data center hardware design. Uh, there is open side that promises to offer a software for it to, to run cloud infrastructure as a service providers. And Cloud Foundry promises to address the platform as a service space, which was launched by, by PMR. So we are starting to see open source software kind of be used to run the cloud open source design and be actually used for this. Uh, so a few words on how the open stack project started. So on one hand, you have Rackspace hosting. Uh, Rackspace hosting runs the Rackspace Cloud. It's a uh, infrastructure as a service offer that has cloud servers on the compute cloud and cloud files on the storage cloud. So it was uh, very successful. Cloud files was written in Python, so it didn't scale horizontally, so the success wasn't really so much an issue. Uh, cloud servers is starting to see its limits in its design, so they wanted to rewrite it uh, in Python, and, and so that it would be horizontally scaled, and so that it can meet the needs of draw. We have also in Powell decided in May 2010 to open source the software behind the infrastructure for the reasons I outlined above. <coughs> on, on, on the other hand, you have NASA. NASA was building a US government private cloud for hosting government sites and, and you know, having information on, on like, pictures of stars. And to open the limits of the software they were using, they started to rewrite their own cloud compute software in, in, in Python, and they were using it uh, in May 2010, they released an early version of it called Nova CC, written in Python and Apache license. Some people noticed the potential for conversions between the two projects, uh, in particular, the, the architecture for the compute part was remarkably similar between the Rackspace space uh, project and, and what NASA put out in the open. <coughs> and, and both were written in Python, so they go to each other and they decided, decided to form a common project called OpenStack, where you would get, take the code from Nova CC from Compute Park and the code from, from Cloud Files running in production at Rackspace for, for the storage part. And here's the next way. The mission statement for the OpenStack project is to produce the ubiquitous open source cloud computing platform that will meet the needs of public and private cloud providers regardless of size by being simple to implement. And massively still. So we did that. <coughs> the, the project was founded on four basic principle. principles: uh, open source. So it's Apache license, and we promise not to move open core or to have an enterprise edition that has all the interesting stuff. <laughs> Everything is, is in the core uh, in, the, in the Apache license code. Open design, we do design summits every six months under the model of the room to design summits. So everyone can, can, can come, everyone can submit blueprints for new ideas and features. We do open development, we do heavy use of distributed version control system. Anyone can propose a branch for merging a track and we do the code reviews in the open as well. So you know why your code is not accepted or accepted. And we do open community, we have uh, all the discussions in public channels, we have community elected technical leads for the project, we have uh, community elected seats on the project board. It's, it's very much under the model of the Apache Foundation for those who know about it. I don't know often, but <coughs> one thing to keep in mind that it's a very young project, it's been one year since. Uh, since it started, we had three design summits, we had three releases. <coughs> so it's about yeah, one year now, I guess. <coughs> it's, it's a young project, but it attracted a lot of attention. There are about 100 developers now that have committed code to one of the core projects of OpenStack with well known names. Uh, those are not the, the usual picture of open staff partners, which are not people committing code, just like giving us a logo. Uh, these are people that have actually developers on payroll committing code, so that's some of the weird ones. Uh, a few words on, on our design and coding standards. So scalability and elasticity are our main goals. Uh, features that limit our goals must be optional. 
everything should be asynchronous. Um, the main components should be horizontally scalable. We shouldn't always use share nothing or sharding. We should distribute everything, uh, especially in logic, and you know, logic where state naturally exists. We should accept eventual consistency and embrace it where appropriate. <coughs> we should test everything. Um, it's unit tests, but also smoke tests that actually deploy the code in uh, some that, that test the data center and run a real worker with that. And we enforce pet A for code consistency, which is extremely important. <laughs> so if you're interested in our, our continuous integration solution, I invite you to come to Solar Hansen and talk tomorrow at noon. Uh, we will go into more detail on how we ensure that, that those rules are, are followed before the code actually hits the trunk and get built into those packages. There are uh, multiple types of open stack projects. There are the core projects which are the one we actually care about. Uh, there are three of them now, Nova for compute, Glance for uh, handling disk images, Swift for storage, and I will go into more details on each of those in the next slide. We also have an incubation process that is very similar to uh, the Apache Foundation incubation process. <coughs> it's usually a project that we would like to have in a core project someday that are not ready yet. But there is a, a common authentication framework for, that will be shared among all the, all the core projects. There is a, a Django-based web UI called Dashboard and we are also building a queue service for, for uh, starting to address the platform as a service space. Nothing in the name of Those are all the uh, type of project. Uh, our race cycle is time-based. We recently moved to a six months race cycle. We, using, we used to have three months race cycle, but it was a bit stressful for the race manager, so we moved to six. And it's a six months race schedule with the, the consolidated properties of all the projects at the same time. Um, most of the core projects are actually following a common milestone, uh, common race schedule. Because we do six months race schedule with frequent milestone in between. So um, we have uh, a top of our release built in like four weeks that are, that are uh, development milestones. And uh, the last development milestone will be another four is extractuate for uh, and, and becomes the final release. We also have a uh, more stable or independent project like Swift, who have their own independent release schedule and they ask us just to include the latest version they have into into the into the, the other side common release. Let, let's go into more detail into what what is those what are those projects. Uh, Swift is the cloud storage part. It's um, object storage, it's not block storage, so you won't like, create a file system on it. Um, it. So you just store and retrieve binary blocks. It does so through a RESTful interface. Um, there is no object size limit except the size of your file. Um, <coughs> it's it, because you will really use segments and manifests, so you can upload multiple parts and then manifest that ties them all together. Uh, it's stable and deployed in production as a uh, space cloud file, so you can test that it works correctly. And it scales massively, and I will explain why. So Swift has three um, levels of, 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 of um, containers. There is the, the account, where, which is usually tied to your credit card. Uh, the container, which is like a folder, and you can store as many objects and as many containers as you want. Uh, and, you, and you have then a flat structure of objects that are accessed by name. Swift uses rings. Uh, rings are distributed hash tables. So you basically partition the, the, the hash in the space into, uh, into smaller bits. And, and that allows you to, to map, well, we'll see how we use them. This is an example of a ring with eight partitions. So anything that hashed from zero to one, <laughs> Falls into the first partition. Does everyone know about DHT already? Yes. <coughs> so, how does it work? When you store an object in Swift, you use a, a, a call like this put slash API version slash name of account slash container slash object. 
And what Swift does is it takes the, the, the kind of slash container slash, slash object part, um, builds an MD5 sum out of it, looks up this MD5 sum onto the object train, and then it falls into one of the partition. And this partition is linked to three, a unique set of three servers. And that gives you the servers where the data will actually be stored. So the file is received by a proxy server. The proxy server looks up where the file should be stored on a local copy of the array, and then stores the object into the three servers. The idea is to have those three servers in three separate zones. Zones can be like a, a switch or a rack or a data center, based on, on, on how lucky you are. <coughs> and, and that handles what it, what it meant for you, so you don't have to uh, have um, pricey object servers with crazy red cards. And this is what it shows with it. So that's pretty cool because it scales horizontally, but there is a, a problem. If you want to to, to actually list the objects that are in a container, you don't have a sensible index that stores everything where it is because then it defeats the whole purpose of using rent. So that's where Swift is a trick. <coughs> it uses another ring. So to list objects in a container, you can get slash API yeah, version slash account slash container. And what Swift does is that it takes account slash container turns it into an MD5 sum, looks it up on a separate ring called the containers ring, and finds the three servers that will actually contain the listing of your object. And you do the same to list containers in an account. You get the list of containers in an account. So your deployment looks like this. You have proxy servers. Each of those have copies of the three rings. And you can have as many of them as you want since you want to handle with a kind of code. And then you deploy object servers, container servers, and account servers in three, at least three, three separate zones. And it scales horizontally, and you can use community hardware to be cheap, you can use crappy disks, it works. <coughs> there are a few other components that the account scraper actually looks up for dead accounts of people that don't pay. And, and remove all their, all their objects. The antenna actually takes care of, of uh, when one server doesn't answer. Uh, there is a fallback server. That fallback server will, will use the antenna will use those small fallback servers to, to copy the, the data back onto the server, the original server. And, and the leaders are uh, calling the object space, just making sure that one of objects is still accessed. was Swift. Um, next project is Glance. So Glance is the image service. <coughs> it's about discovering, registering, and retrieving disk images and uh, associated metadata. So it's a very special service. It's very, it's much smaller than the other. <coughs> it supports multiple disk formats. It supports multiple container formats. Going to details. Uh, here is the architecture slide. So we have Glance API which received the request from the clients. The clients are talking a RESTful API called the Glance API. We are uh, providing a CLI tool um, for Glance, and also a Glance client hyper library if you want to roll your own. But anything that actually speaks to REST Glance API is quite easy to, to write your own client code. So uh, Glance API received a request. It uses an internal REST API called the Registry API to um, query metadata information or location information about the disk images. And so we provide one reference implementation of it called the Glance Registry, which has an SQL backend, but feel free to implement your own uh, crazy no SQL uh, version of it, uh, as long as it speaks the Registry API, which is uh, REST API with Glance API. And this API uses multiple storage backends where it actually stores the disk image. So you can use Swift, you can use Amazon S3, you can use a local file system that's useful for the test. And you can also um, use HTTP links that's only a read on it. And you know, basically tell clients where to fetch an image that is available over the internet. And you can combine them all and then they are not exclusive. Last but not least, 
drug from here. So this is by far the largest, and um, it's you can think of it as, as PMs being just one API code away. It's highly modular framework, so you have to pick exactly the deployment options that you actually want to run. There are tons of hypervisors that we support you as we don't want to support all of them at the same time. It's still under heavy development, we're still refactoring things, trying to set up things up. So uh, it's uh, the risky thing is right now, but it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to test, but for deployment, you better have a good IT management team. And it's used in production in as a Nimbla cloud currently, so it's working. And Rackspace uh, cloud service is expected to, to go uh, using Nova by before the end of the Needs to be ready. So about the different components. So it's also a horizontally scalable uh, component based system. Uh, we have API nodes who are responsible for receiving client requests and, and acting on them. Uh, scheduling nodes that uh, actually decide where uh, a given request will actually be, be, be uh, done. A compute node that are responsible for the VMs themselves. Uh, so they spin up the VMs. Network nodes which provide network resources for, for compute nodes. And volume nodes which uh, have uh, the, 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 can contain block storage or interface with block, uh, with block storage. And all this is linked to a uh, message queue. We use one different queue. And you can have any number of, uh, of those components that is actually needed to, 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 to uh, have your to have a relatively low number of, of, of compute of uh, DMs, but a large number of, of API calls, then you should speed up more API nodes if you are around, better at compute nodes. <coughs> So, for example, if you ask for a new server to be create, created, the client would uh, request to be received by the API node. The API node will put a message on the queue saying, well, this server uh, <coughs> should be created. A scheduler node, one scheduler node, somewhere will pick up the request and uh, apply some internal algorithm to decide where it should be handled and put back a message on the queue uh, to, to, to that compute node. That compute node will pick up the message on the queue uh, Require these conditions from events, and then ask the network node for network resources like I don't know, IP addresses or, or networks or firewalls, and, and, and then we finally spin up the VM. And you can, you know, if the client queries for the location of this uh, of this uh, server, the, the system will try to to achieve that. So I said we should. Always share nothing, but unfortunately, no one shares it. We have a data set. We're, we're trying to get rid of it, and it's, and it's, uh, it's hard to kill. So we're trying to move um, as, as to shop as much information as we can among the different nodes and push as much information as we can into the queue rather than have a central uh, data store. It's an interesting project, I was interested. A few words on modularity. I said it's a highly modular framework. Uh, so the API node is actually a WSD middleware, so you can stack up any, any authentication, any whatever compressing stuff that you have. Uh, we support two APIs, the EC2 and the OpenStack API. So the EC2 API is going to be used due to uh, the success of Amazon Web Services. But we also provide our own OpenStack API. The reason for this is that we want to be stuck with what Amazon dictates the cloud is. Uh, we actually want to be part of it. So if we have a shiny new feature, we, we want to expose it to our users. And that's why we, we have the OpenStack API. Uh, we support multiple uh, authentication plugins, database, all that, but that should be replaced by, by the Keystone project, which will have uh, database and all the backends. The idea is that you will be able to share tokens between the different points of our project. Uh, the scheduler node is, uh, this is a plugable algorithm. We collect two of them, uh, Chance, which is going to be one robin, and uh, Zona, where scheduler are in there. There is a third one now. <coughs> but it's just a matter of extending a class to, to provide your own logic. <coughs> the, the queue is actually AMQP, uh, any AMQP queue. It's not like tied to any queue. 
and the data store you can use SQLite for like development setup. MySQL, Postgres, Network uh, <coughs> Node, support three network nodes, uh, IPv4 and IPv6. Uh, for the compute node, we support a large number of hypervisors. Uh, so QNU, KDM, UML, LXC, Zen, Zen Server, uh, Microsoft Hyper-V if you really want to. Uh, VMware, this, uh, VMware vSphere, if you say it. <coughs> and for volume nodes, we support local LVM volume, volume groups, remote ISCS storage, shape log volumes, and uh, HP signs. That's what I meant by lots of different options. You don't want to run everything at the same time. At the same time. Coming up in the next phase of NOVA, uh, we're uh, actively simplifying NOVA to, to, to separate some functionality out of it. So we're, uh, we have planned to separate the block storage service, the volume uh, windows that you see, so that they, they answer their own REST in API, and that NOVA will use it to collect. That's a project for Lunar. Um, we hope that it will be sufficiently complete so that it can be an option for, for, for NOVA by, by September 22, which is the date of the release of this version. We also uh, plan to set up network services. We have uh, a number of, of uh, projects that can spawn quantum that provides the network API that would be used by the cloud computer. So you could request an IP address, you could request an elastic IP address, you could request a network, a connectman, etc. Melange, which is a network resource registry, so like an IP address uh, directory. And Tonabe, which uh, addresses uh, complex network containers, so you can dis describe your, uh, your network configuration and uh, tell Tonabe to actually uh, make it happen with very intelligent switches. And finally, Keystone already mentioned. Um, so try to have all those core projects use the same authentication mechanism. Also, we'll have snapshot, clone, and good from volumes. Uh, this thing is coming because we have the notion that the idea of zones now. Uh, we should hopefully complete the OpenStack API 1.1. And we should hopefully have configuration drives, which are like. Um, Data, the disks that are mounted on the VM's use phone that contain data that the user provides. So that helps you uh, communicate with your instance and, and, and customize it before you. Okay. Python. Uh, why do we use Python? Uh, there was a good editor talk on, on what makes Python awesome on Monday. On Monday. Uh, what makes Python awesome for us, at least for me, is that uh, our users are not end users, but now not really programmers either. So having a language that is easy to learn, that is uh, easy to read, and easy to patch for system bins, that, that <coughs> brings uh, the, 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 the users of our software are actually able to continue to patch this back. And, and that, that's the main, I mean, for me, that's the main feature of Python that, uh, that is relevant well here. Uh, it's that it's a community of neighbor. It's very really useful to have a simple language that, that people can actually learn in one day or one week and start contributing back fixes. But it's also about uh, lots of very interesting libraries. Um, so we're using Lingert, especially for, for um, having um, this uh, real connection of uh, hypervisors. So Lingert provides for us the interaction layer that allows us to have those many any uh, hypervisors. Um, really for uh, concurrency, we're using EventNet. <coughs> so there was a big debate, twisted versus EventNet, at uh, one of our design summits. And, and we settled on EventNet, which was used by like, half of the project. <coughs> Mostly because it's easier for uh, someone that doesn't know anything about, about the currency to use. Well, <coughs> you have to think the twisted way. Um, we use Pest deploy for the MISD configuration handling. We use uh, WebAuth to encapsulate response and request objects. We use Roots for uh, setting up, uh, if you're lazy, to set up the REST endpoints. <coughs> We're using Tarot 
to interact with the queue with together with MQP bit for the kind of to be discontinued, so we or we need to move to the code rule now. We use SQL Alchemy for the interaction of at the at the data store layer in um, in the three projects. And we use SQL Alchemy migrate to migrate the schema the database schema from one version to another every time you change the schema. And as far as plugging goes, um, we're using standard blogging, standard HTTP, um, standard JSON. Uh, we're using Bodo to talk S3 with, with Amazon. We're using it to crypto for anything cryptographic. Jumpa is using G flags for, for configuration files, but I think um, we are going to move away from that. So, uh, if you could come and join the fund, it's a very open project. Uh, a few more URLs for you. Uh, we are very active on RC, uh, so there is the OpenStack channel if you know my uh, user, uh, user of the software, and the OpenStack there uh, where uh, the development discussions happen. We have weekly team meetings on RC, so it's, uh, it's a bit inconvenient for Europeans, it's like a year of jam on Tuesdays, uh, and uh, we have a mailing list, a central mailing list for, for our discussions. That's it. Questions? Sometimes, what they 
the time it takes for them to write the chapter, it's, it's already obsolete. So it's, uh, it's definitely a concern. Um, and there are teams now at uh, Flaxbase that sell uh, training and, and provide good, good documentation. So I hope that it will be, it will be improved. But the software needs to uh, count down and, and, and slow down a bit if you want any documentation to be accurate. <coughs> so Swift documentation is, is, is OK. Uh, the inline documentation and uh, everything we generate by Sphinx is actually quite accurate. <coughs> the, the, the PDF looks are uh, not that accurate. And for no one especially. <coughs> Like this, uh, in the development part of the API, is, uh, often uh, there are only the documentation uh, defined in the uh, procedure uh, function. The, the, the API is one of the things that are actually going to document it. The other side, the Nova, in the Nova part. In what? The Nova. In the uh, development. Development part of Nova. You mean the, the OpenStack API or? Yes. Yeah. The OpenStack API is very well defined. The problem is do we, do we actually implement it correctly? No. Correctly, but uh, um, deeper. So very, very short. Yeah, it can always be improved, and it's a, it's a community project, so. <laughs> if you're really interested in it, it's. Uh, I think the best documentation came from, from, from outside of the developer group. And, 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 Public clouds can be private clouds, can be coded inside the firewall, and the idea behind hybrid clouds is that you, you can you can deploy half of it. Well, you can move your application from the private side to the public side first to the public cloud, etc. So OpenStack is an enabler of hybrid clouds because uh, it's it's going to just say, well, we are C2 compatible, but it's it's not enough because everyone has, has its own um, version. They are not seen. If OpenStack wins and becomes the Apache of the cloud, then you will have OpenStack clouds everywhere. And you can run your uh, private cloud with exactly the same code as the Workspace and others. And then it's uh, like true compatibility, not just like all these API looks that it's the same, it's, it looks like it's 99.9% correct. <coughs> uh, it's, it's about running exactly the same code. So uh, I hope that. Um, OpenStack will facilitate the, their versions of hybrid clouds and make them, uh, and the emergence of federation of clouds, of cloud markets, so that you can compare the prices and the services of each, of each uh, provider and drive the cost down and drive Amazon to the brain. That's my personal goal. Before you said that uh, you were using a mix of eventlet and twisted, and uh, you are now uh, focusing on, on eventlet, but um, I had a look at the, at the source of Fornova, and there um, are the, both two things living together. Is there any class to phase out? Uh, I mean, there is one, or or yeah, there is one component that I didn't mention in, in the architecture side that um, is the Nova Object Store that still uses Twisted for its own reason. I don't know. Oh, it Replace it with you know, something not twisted so we can remove the dependency. 
Uh, this is not you know, doing you know, twisted these sort of things. It's just using, I forget what this might be, like a large rotating thing, or you know, just really not asynchronous related stuff. Uh, so, no, we don't use those anymore. Um, if you look at it, oh, it's really easy. Uh, let's look at the latest one. That's called that. Oh, yeah, ancient. I mean, it's. Okay. <laughs> I mean, time flies. I saw a man by Kruger heavy technology. I've just seen uh, the, uh, using the rings, you can uh, point to a disk or so. I mean, I mean, a uh, part of the storage. I mean, coming from the account and the container, so you can point to the correct data you, you need for your uh, current uh, the machine you're running at the moment. I've seen that you have, uh, for instance, three times the same data in the, in the slide, replicated three or a number of times uh, of replicas uh, of the same, uh, the same uh, data. They, they are uh, kept uh, in any case uh, current, you, are, you work with one single, single instance uh, and the other two are kept uh, aligned with it. Also, you understand that you have, you declare, you have no rate uh, or no redundancy on this data. And the, uh, the last, uh, uh, and how can you, and you used to move data uh, yeah, the the, the previous one, okay. Yes, and then this in this part of the uh, next one. Next? Yes. <laughs> okay, that's one for now. So you can uh, point it to zone A, zone B, or zone C according to the... Uh, no, it's not or, it's and. It's and, so you can get the amount of data from all of the three uh, areas. So the okay. I well, so the this partition the partition contains the names of the three servers that should contain your data. It actually also contains two additional servers, which are the full by servers. Okay, that's correct. And that's the one used when when one or two of those servers don't answer. <coughs> so you have uh, five servers with three primary servers in, uh, and the system makes sure that you have uh, those three servers yeah. and it's at least three separate zones. This is configurable. You can have six instead of five. And they so, are kept uh, aligned in any case. Yeah, when the, when the proxy server receives the push request, it actually uh, puts the request asynchronously onto a screen location. It's not just one. Okay. And, and that's where the redundancy happens. It's why we don't really want to care about rain because that's just one aspect of, of redundancy. Right? Then there is power, and then there is the OS, and then there is the room or whatever. <clears throat> so we, we don't really care. We, what we want is to store it in three separate places, and, 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 and the we can have redundancy, I guess. <laughs> you could you increase the global redundancy by, by setting all those on the right servers, but the idea is to use cheap hardware rather than an expensive one. So better better not to be on the right and not to grind the performance of your system and store it in straight the place. This is eventually consistent. It's not uh, it, it's not like atomic commits or, or whatever. It stores uh, when when it can and then when you trigger that data you might get you do it very, very fast than the previous version. Or... Okay. And in this case, uh, the supervisor of the, of the own storage can define where the uh, data storage are kept in which country. I mean, data, we have some uh, uh, laws about uh, keeping data in the United Union, for instance, so you can define that uh, your object server B uh, should, or all your uh, Object server for a specific customer must be located in a, in a country. So that, that that's why Italian Telecom is uh, uh, suggesting their own cloud. That's uh, new features for Swift. I don't have a plan to add that to have that geographic aware uh, type of queries. Currently, it's it's 
it's tailored to the needs of, of Rockspace Cloud, so it's like a central community thing that is running in the US or a unique thing that is running in the UK or completely separate. So they don't really care about, about geographies and all this like, like, like Amazon does. Um, but they want to they want to have a pluggable um, uh, way of storing things. So, so that you can use a cluster like that if you want to uh, or others. So I know they and they want to support geographic queries. Uh, the, the terrain is is a bit more complex than I showed on this screen. Because it, it's weighted, so uh, the, the size of your partition depends on, on if you have larger servers, obviously you want you want them to store more data. So it's it's a bit weighted. Uh, and it's it's there is an offline tool to generate those and it's it's in a button you can you can make the, the, the tool can be generated on all those uh, API servers and we'll become some things at the end. <coughs> so whenever you add servers, obviously some partitions get split into based on their uh, current level of use. Uh, it, 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 there is lots of smart things done by, by the script frame to, to ensure that you get the optimal the optimal uh, Prior to that, but it's a, it's a bit more complex than just speak, just speaking the hash space and the partitions.
it's the only three project that I think should be core project for the next one. The idea is that, that you are incubating, incubating for one, one cycle, and then the next one cycle will part of the core project. So again, we need to make sure that um, they're, they're up to par for our, our release management process, that they're, they're uh, like, uh, sufficiently present on our system that we can communicate with them, uh, that they're sufficiently integrated with the way things work so that we can actually work with them as a whole project. <coughs> and there are lots of related projects that we can talk about now. It's, uh, it's things that will never be involved, like uh, mobile phone clients or, or uh, deployment tools that, that well, there are like 10 of them. Uh, we don't really want to choose between, the, between those. They are all working with OpenStack or OpenStack compatible and have a sticker, but I don't think they should be made a core project of, uh, of OpenStack. Uh, is Glance meant just to store read only these images or also modify them? I'm thinking that the difference between a seed one image and uh, a virtual machine is uh, snapshot. Uh, it's meant to store. I think it's meant to store the, the, the base images that, that the, the, the compute service will offer as an option. So, like, uh, you want to go to a uh, server, uh, you know, then we go to LTS, then the uh, grant service, and we need to search uh, the, the base for all those that are compatible with that, and, and the, the run that the, 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 the run and CPU option that you want, and we that this image. And we also push the idea of, of rather than preparing to do um, big time configuration. That's uh, what uh, we do that with our uh, Bluetooth cloud images. So you have a common image and, and you put it with, with specific parameters that, that actually configure so into something that has okay, well. and uh, I think it's better than, than the return name stuff where you need to upload Work. That's how Amazon, Amazon does it. Like the, you need to uh, remember your image and upload it again to a screen store there, and that's that's a slightly different approach. I don't see why plants could not be used to store like snapshots or. It does. It does? Yeah. Do you want to create a snapshot? Yes. It ends up in time. That's how it works. Okay. Not good. Not storage, but the storage uh, room. Both from volumes in separate snapshots. Oh, that, yeah, but what? Well, um, I think it must be the OpenStack API that has a, uh, uh, an API call to create a snapshot of, of a running virtual machine, and that ends up in plants. That's where it, it extracts it and puts it into plants. We are, yeah, we are, we are adding uh, the, the, the new version. It's a snapshot, clone, and put from volumes. So that's a block storage that is handled by, by the volume API. <coughs> so that's one option. But you, you can also snapshot these images and then push them to plants and put from that instead. So it's, like I said, lots of options. Sometimes it's difficult to tell which option is the best combination for your use case. We expect that uh, the Ubuntu guys will come up with, with uh, like a standard we're going to centrate a way of a mm -hmm. selection of components that makes sense all together to deploy a private cloud with the next uh, target, and that will be easier for our to test. We can actually deploy all the components in a single machine and, and run uh, with the local Habitat queue and, and, uh, and SQLite databases and, and test everything for this on a single machine, which is very useful. It scales coverage. Yeah. Well. So it's, uh, it's not that difficult to use between Just last uh, quick question. Actually, I have two questions. So. <laughs> 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 not too bad. Um, first question is, um, how long is it going to take uh, <laughs> before this open start in production? Well, it depends on your... Uh, uh, it's already, all the contracts are already, already used in production, so uh, except NAT. Um, so uh, 
Swift is used in production for Jack and white space cat files. And uh, so it's, it's like it's the code that we released a version on Monday, and, and it's already deployed on white space cat in production. So this is very much production ready. Uh, Nova is run is running in production at NASA and for the Libra account, which is made for calculation and also to host of various websites like whitehouse.com. Uh, and and so it worked. It's the question is the, the you have to pick the most stable components, uh, you have to have uh, a good crew of um, system to keep up with what you should write to, what you should to provide the glue when the, when the migration is not, is not that easy from one version to another. So it's, it's, it's tricky to deploy it for people to have no value production, like in a small of IT. Yeah, so you can definitely test it. You should test it to make sure that it works for your workload. It's the best way to make sure that it will meet your needs of tomorrow. Deploying today in production with a small IT, uh, IT uh, uh, service uh, uh, and, and, and in, in a private enterprise to, to serve uh, users, it's a bit risky. I expect it to stabilize in six months once we separate all those APIs. I think that the, the migration from the current version to the next version where we have those API uh, separated and, and the new services are, are are fully replacing the old ones, I think the migration path will be Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Peter.